Howdy. So what have we learned? We've learned that having full subshell electronic gases is extra stable, and so elements tend to gain, lose, or share electrons to get normal gas configuration. When they share electrons, they form covalent bonds. If there's a transfer of electrons, typically an ionic compound is formed. When two metal, non-metal elements react, covalent bonds are formed. When a metal and a non-metal element react, an ionic compound is formed. And so for molecular compounds, you have a sharing of electrons. The um, more electrons being shared, the stronger the bond. The smaller the atoms, the closer the atoms, the stronger the bond. And so we can determine this relative strength of covalent bonds based on one, the number of electrons being shared, and two, the size of the atoms. For ionic compounds, electrons are transferred. The metal loses electrons, the nonmetal gains electrons. And we can determine the relative strength of the ion ion interaction and hence the lattice enthalpy and melting point by one looking at the absolute value of the charges. The bigger the absolute value of the charges, the stronger the attraction, higher the melting point. And then secondarily, the smaller the ions, the closer ions, the stronger the attraction, the higher the lattice enthalpy, the higher the melting point. Now today I thought we'd talk about polar covalent bonds and Lewis electron dot diagrams. And so you can imagine that pure ionic compounds and pure covalent compounds are the ideal and much of reality is actually somewhere in between. So sometimes polar bonds will lead to a molecule being polar, which greatly affects the compound's physical properties. And so the concept of polarity is rather important. Lewis lock dot diagrams are a simple yet powerful tool for understanding where electrons are in molecules. And as long as you're doing chemistry, you will be doing Lewis diagrams. So after watching this video, you should be able to describe how often bonding electrons are equally shared. You should be able to describe how the electronegativity atoms can be used to determine the type of bonds atoms form and which one has the bonding electron density. You should be able to determine the type of bond formed using electronegativities. And you should be able to describe the basics of Lewis electron dot diagrams. And so electronegativity is the ability of an atom to draw electrons to itself in a molecule. Now the difference electronegativity is symbolized by delta chi is just the electronegativity of one atom minus the electronegativity of the other atom. Now we always do big and small, small, and so the difference electronegativity is always defined as being positive. Now if the difference electronegativity is really small, less than 0.5, then nonpolar covalent bonds will be formed. And so the bonding electrons will be equally shared. If the difference electronegativity is greater than two, then an ion compound will be formed and there'll be a transfer of electrons. If the difference electronegativity is between 0.5 and two, then polar covalent bonds are shared. And so there'd be unequal sharing of the bonding electrons. An atom attempts to attract electrons toward itself when bonding with another atom. The level of attraction of each atom is called its electronegativity. When sodium and chlorine react, the chlorine atom removes sodium's valence electron and becomes a chloride ion. The less electronegative sodium atom cannot compete for electrons and becomes a sodium ion. The attraction between the ions is an ionic bond. When bonding atoms have nearly equal electronegativities, neither can attract electrons away from the other. In a carbon-sulfur bond, the electron pair is shared almost equally between the two atoms, resulting in a covalent bond. When hydrogen and oxygen react, the more electronegative oxygen atom cannot completely remove an electron from hydrogen. The shared electrons are attracted more to the oxygen than to the hydrogen atom. This unequal sharing is called a polar covalent bond. Polar bonds have a slightly negative and a slightly positive end. And so I apologize for them showing the electrons little dots. Remember, electrons are dot little particles. And so if the difference in electronegativity is less than 0.5, the bonding electrons are equally shared, and so we consider the bonds nonpolar covalent. If the difference in electronegativity is greater than two, there's a transfer of electrons and an ionic compound is formed. 
if the difference in electron negativity is between 0.5 and 2, then there's unequal sharing of the bonding electrons, and we consider a polar covalent bond. Now, the 0.5 and 2 are just rules of thumb, so they're not strict cutoffs. You should also remember when we talked about the product trends, we saw that as you go up into the right and product table, the strength of electrostatic attraction between the outer electron and the nucleus increases, ionization energy increases, electron affinity increases, electron negativity increases, um, and size decreases. You should also notice that the number below the symbol on most of the product tables that we use has the electronegativity. And so we can think about, you know, nonpolar, ionic, and polar covalent. We could think about as you go from right to left, you're increasingly covalent character, or as you're going from left to right, increasingly ionic character. And so it's not just strict cutoffs that this is covalent, this is ionic, but you can actually think about in terms of how much covalent character or how much ionic character. And so this is really kind of cool. This is the percent ionic character. This is electronegativity difference. And so the brown color, we're taking fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine with hydrogen. The green color, we're taking fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine with lithium. The blue is with potassium, or the purple with potassium, and blue with cesium. But it's kind of interesting. As you increase the percent ionic character, corresponds to increase in electronegativity. Or maybe think about bigger increased electronegativity, bigger ionic character. And so it's interesting for these four, those are all molecules. And so HI is going to be nonpolar covalent. And then HF is going to be a, a fairly polar molecule. Now, the rest of these are forming ionic compounds. Even though lithium bromide, lithium iodide, uh, potassium iodide, the difference like negativity is less than two, we would consider that these are ionic compounds. And then as you go to a bigger difference like negativity, we'd say the percent ion character is even more. And so you can imagine that maybe in the lithium bromide, lithium iodide, there's a little bit covalent character as, as well as the ionic character. And then, so we saw that as you go from right to left, you're increasing covalent character, left to right, increasing ionic character, left to right, you'd also argue that it was increasingly polar bond. And so if we have a very small difference like negativity, here's 0.46, so less than 0.5, and so we'd consider the bonding electrons equally shared. Now hydrogen has one Venn's electron, the atom, and you can imagine, that, okay, if it's equally shared, maybe it's got the electron density for one electron here, and so that means hydrogen would be charge neutral. The iodide has seven, has seven Venn's electrons, and you can imagine, okay, maybe the electron density for seven you know, these six plus that one is around the iodide, and so that would mean that it's charge neutral. Now for HCl, your difference electron negativity is 0.96, and so the bonding electrons are not equally shared. So the chlorine is more electronegative, and so we'd imagine that it has more of the bonding electron density than the hydrogen, and so it would see, you know, set six, seven, plus a little bit more um, Vance electron density, and so that would give it a negative charge. The hydrogen would see a little bit less than one electron versus electron density, and so that would give it a positive charge. So equal sharing is here, and both of those atoms would be charge neutral, no net charge. Unequal sharing leads to one atom having a partial positive charge, and the other atom having a partial negative charge. Now, this is a fairly accurate de depiction of HCl. And so you have the, the little ball representing the hydrogen, big ball chlorine, and then the surface corresponds to what we call as the one value of the electron density. And so most molecules are not balls and sticks, they're, they're glob-like. And so this is kind of what HCl looks like. Now, if we actually measure the electrostatic potential on the surface, 
And so the red corresponds to partial negative charge and the blue corresponds to partial positive charge. And so this is what we mean by polar, partial positive and a partial negative. And so hydrogen's electronegativity is 2.2, chlorine is 3.5, and so that gives us a difference of 1.3. Now again, because chlorine is more electronegative, it's going to have more of the bonding electron density, and it will be partial negative. And because hydrogen is less electronegative, it will have less of the bonding electron density, and it will have a partial positive charge. And so this is what we refer to as a polar molecule and a polar bond. And so for if you have two atoms, if the molecule is polar, then the bond is polar. Sorry, if you have two atoms, if the bond is polar, then the molecule is polar. We'll see later that you can have molecule with polar bonds that is nonpolar. But if you have a diatomic molecule, if the bond is polar, then the molecule is polar. So does sodium and fluorine combine to form molecules or on a compound? And so sodium's here, it's a metal, fluorine's here, it's a non-metal, and based on metal plus non-metal would say ionic compound. Now if we want to look at electronegativity, remember electronegativity is below the, the symbol. So you got 0.93 and 4, so that's greater than 3. And so we'd say that the difference of electronegativity is greater than 3. And so that would have to be an ionic compound. Are hydrogen oxygen bonds in water polar or nonpolar? And so again, if we think about electronegativity, electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2, of oxygen is 3.4, that gives us a difference of 1.2. And so that means that those bonds should be polar. And so remember, if the difference of negativity is less than 0.5, we call it nonpolar covalent. If it's greater than 2, it's ionic. If it's between 0.5 and 2, then we'd say polar covalent. Now, this is a pretty good depiction of water. Um, and so you see the partial positive charge of the hydrogen, and you see a partial negative charge for the oxygen. Are the hydrogen nitrogen bonds in NH3 polar or nonpolar? And so nitrogen has electronegativity of 3. Hydrogen's 2.2. That gives us 0.8. And so that would be polar. And again, here's a decent depiction of ammonia. You know, the hydrogen is less electronegative, so it has a partial positive charge. The nitrogen is more electronegative, and so it has a partial negative charge. Are all the hydrogen-nitrogen bonds polar? Now, using this criteria, we'd say that all nitrogen-hydrogen bonds should be polar because the electronegativity is not changing. And so the differences are going to change. And so whenever you got the difference electronegativity between nitrogen and hydrogen, you'll get the same answer of 0.8. And so then all those nitrogen and hydrogen bonds should be polar. And so how about the hydrocarbon bonds? Are those polar or nonpolar? So 2.6, 2.2, that gives us 0.4. And so that would be nonpolar. And so this is kind of interesting. For hydrocarbons, they tend to be nonpolar because the carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar, and carbon typically does not have a lone pair of electrons. And so this is a fairly good depiction of um, methane, carbon with four hydrogens. Because all those bonds are nonpolar, you don't have a partial positive or a partial negative. So put the following in order of least polar to most polar. And so the fluorine fluorine should be the least polar because it can't be polar because the difference of negativity would be zero. And then you notice everything's bound to fluorine. And so the farther from fluorine, the more polar. So it's probably going to be 
silicon fluorine is going to be the most polar and then maybe carbon fluorine nitrogen fluorine oxygen fluorine and then fluorine fluorine is the least polar so least to most so i'd say fluorine 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 oxygen fluorine nitrogen fluorine carbon and then fluorine silicon and we just use the product trends to figure out the um, polarity of those bonds by atomic molecule a polar bond must lead to a polar molecule Consider hydrogen fluoride, shown here as the Lewis structure changes to a ball and stick model enclosed within the space filling shape. Note the polar arrows and the colors. If red indicates high electron density and blue indicates low, you can see that the F end of the molecule is much more negative than the H end and thus HF is highly polar. Between two electric plates with the field off, the molecules lie every which way. With the field on, however, they become oriented with their negative ends facing the positive plate and their positive ends facing the negative plate. And so it's true that the molecule has a, a partial positive on one side and a partial negative on the other side if it's polar. And so if you put it in an electric field, it will line up. But that's not the most important reason or the most important thing about polar molecules. The most important thing about polar molecules is that if they're polar, they're going to have a stronger electrostatic attraction to each other. And so again, electrostatic interaction affects interactions between molecules. If molecules are polar, they'll have a stronger attraction to each other. And so we have to understand if a molecule is polar or nonpolar so we can understand how it interacts with other molecules. So the polarity of a molecule affects its solubility, molten point, boiling point, and vapor pressure. So those diagrams help keep track of electrons around atoms, ions, and molecules, and help us predict the structure of molecules. If you know the number of electrons in the valence shell of an atom, Writing Lewis diagrams is not too bad. Lewis diagrams are typically used for SMP block elements. It is essential that you learn how to draw Lewis diagrams. As long as you're doing chemistry, you will be doing new Lewis diagrams. And so Lewis electron diagram, diagrams, each valence electron is represented by a dot. Um, a single dot represents the electron on, on its own in an orbital. A pair of dots represents um, electrons sharing an orbital. And so here we have for oxygen. Here we have the electron configuration for oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. And so the Lewis diagram only worry about the valence electrons. And so remember valence means outer shell, biggest n. And so that would be the second shell, the 2s and 2p. And so we got two electrons share this orbital. That's represented by two of those. Two electrons share another orbital. And then you got two electrons in orbitals by themselves. And so a single dot to represent, represent electrons in orbitals by themselves. Two dots together represent um, electrons sharing an orbital. Now it actually doesn't matter where you put the dots. You know, here I put the, the pairs across from each other, but you can put the pairs here or here or here. What's important is that you have the number of valence electron correct, and the number of paired and unpaired correct as well. And so this is the first three rows of the park table in terms of their Lewis dots. Remember, going down the column, elements have the same valence electron configuration, and so tend to behave alike. And so it's kind of interesting, we can, you know, compare the different models. And so this is the Lewis diagram. This is the Bohr model, which isn't really that helpful. You know, the atoms are actually in atomic orbitals, which represent, represent here. And if we're actually able to see an atom, it would probably more look like this. It would be spherical. Remember, you have a superposition of states. And so the electrons would probably actually um, be in many states, and you'd end up with a spherical um, 
the shape. And so if we want to think about ionic compounds into a, in terms of Lewis dots, you know, sodium starts with one Benz electron, chlorine has seven. The sodium loses one of those, so it has a plus charge. And now the chlorine will have eight and have a minus charge, and they both have noble gas configuration. Now in terms of the formation of molecule, you know, I've mentioned many times that elements tend to lose, share, or gain electrons to get noble gas configuration. And so fluorine atoms have seven Venn's electrons. Now, if they want to get noble gas configuration, if they can share these two, then they'll both C8. So here we got fluorine, it sees two, four, six, eight. This fluorine sees two, four, six, eight. And so again, this is what I mean when I say that elements tend to share electrons to get noble gas configuration. You know, they can see eight Venn's electrons, which is noble gas configuration. Now the electrons that they're sharing, those are referred to as the bonding electrons. And, off, and often we can use a single line to represent the bonding electrons. Now the electron pairs that are not being shared, those are referred to as unshared electron pairs or lone pairs. And so you got to make sure that you use the right number of Venn's electrons. So we start with 14 Venn's electrons, two, four, six, seven, two, four, six, seven, seven times two is 14. And it's exactly the number that we use, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. And so it's important that when you're doing Lewis diagrams, you always use the right number of Venn's electrons. And so if we replace these two with a line, we get this. And this is a typical Lewis diagram for a molecule. Now we could ask what's the bond order of the fluorine fluorine bond. And a single line means two electrons. The bond order is the number of pairs of electrons being shared. And so we'd say the bond order was one. If we look at another example, here we got hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Hydrogen starts with one vents, oxygen starts with two, four, six valence. Now, if this hydrogen oxygen share these two, and this hydrogen oxygen share those two, we get that. And again, the shared electrons, the bonding electrons, we can replace with a straight line. And so this is the uh, Lewis diagram for water. Now, oxygen sees two, four, six, eight. So it sees a noble gas configuration. Hydrogen sees two which for it is noble gas configuration of helium. And so again, elements tend to lose gain or share electrons to get noble gas configuration. We started with, with two, four, six, eight Venn's electrons, and we used eight Venn's electrons. What is the bond order of the OH bonds? Well, they're just sharing one pair. And so bond order is never a pair is being shared. And so that would be a bond order of one. Now, Lewis dot diagram does not um, accurately depict the actual structure. And so this is a decent depiction of the structure of water molecule. We'll see why it's this shape in the next coming weeks. The Lewis diagram just shows us where the Venn's electrons are with which atoms they're associated. But the Lewis diagram does not accurately depict the structure. Um, later, we will use the Lewis diagram to uh, determine structures. You know, often we could draw the Lewis diagram for methane, carbon with four hydrogens this way, and so it makes it look like those bond angles are 90, but the bond angles are actually about 107.9 degrees. And so again, please remember Lewis diagrams do not accurately depict the structure of a molecule. They just show us with what atom the Venn's electrons are associated. If we look at carbon monoxide, so carbon has four Venn's, oxygen starts with six, that gives us 10, two, four, six, eight, 10. And so by sharing these six electrons, both the carbon and oxygen get noble gas configuration, right? So the oxygen sees two, four, six, eight, the carbon sees two, four, six, eight, and so again, elements tend to gain, lose, or share electrons to get noble gas configuration. 
Also, please notice it doesn't matter where the electron started with, right? So when we're doing Lewis diagrams, what we're doing is we're ripping off all the electrons. So we got two, four, six, ten, and then we're placing them where we'll think it will give us the most stable structure. So what is the bond order of the carbon oxygen bond? Well, we got two, four, six, six electrons are being shared. That's three pairs. And so the bond order would be three. And again, that's a fairly decent depiction of um, carbon monoxide. And so hopefully you can describe how often bonding electrons are unequally shared. You should be able to describe how the electronegativity of an ion can be used to determine if a bond is polar covalent, nonpolar covalent, or ionic. Hopefully you can also describe the basics of Lewis diagrams. I hope that helps.